Hello, I'm Lori Robbins and I write crime fiction. My latest book, Murder in First Position, was released this past November and it takes place, as you might be able to guess from the cover, in a professional ballet company. I'm a former dancer and I couldn't resist setting a murder mystery in that very dramatic setting. Uh, but you don't have to know anything at all about dance to enjoy the book, as I hope to convince you with this excerpt from chapter one, Murder in First Position. I was the girl all the other kids wanted to kill. Skinny, pretty, and confident, I was the target of much envy and very little affection. I realized later that people resented my extreme disinterest in their lives, but it was never personal, because all I ever cared about was ballet. These days, I wasn't quite so dismissive, even though the gap between us had gotten wider. Because while my former classmates were still young, I was old. Not too old to get pregnant, and not too old to make partner in a law firm, but definitely old for a ballerina trying to make a comeback. And for me, nothing else counted. It wasn't bitter. One minute you were the newest baby ballerina and the darling of every critic. The next thing you knew, you were having knee surgery and the New York Times dance czar was faintly praising you for your mature artistry, which was ballet speak for time to retire. But I wasn't ready to hang up my point shoes and Brian Lester was my ticket to the future. I didn't have much time. American Ballet Company had commissioned a new ballet from Ryan and I wanted the lead role. If my performing career were to end soon and persistent pain from my recently reconstructed knee indicated just that, then I wanted to go out with a bang on my terms, not anyone else's. I called Brian the night before we were due to return from our summer break. I wanted to grab him before anyone else called in her chips. Brian, it's me, how are you? How is mom talk? This seemed like a good opening. People love talking about their vacations. At least over the phone, you don't have to look at any pictures. Brian's enthusiasm didn't match mine. Uh, Leah, the summer was great. Yeah, it was great. Seriously, I've been meaning to call you, but I was, you know, about to leave for a really important appointment. Talk to you tomorrow. As call ended floated across the screen, I pondered his lack of interest. When we first met, he answered my calls as excitedly as a freshman girl who's been asked to the prom by the captain of the soccer team. But Brian sounded more like a college kid whose mo mother has phoned during his fraternity's beer pong competition. I worried all night about whether or not I'd be cast in Brian's ballet or any ballet. The next morning, I got up early and anxiously checked my email. If Grayson Averin, the Times chief dance critic, had finally written his long promised feature article about my collaboration with Brian, I'd automatically become a hot commodity. Powerful men would be calling me instead of the other way around. As I entered the lobby of the ballet studio, a different kind of nightmare emerged when a barrage of texts pinged in rapid fire succession. By the time I disengaged my phone from the depths of my dance bag, the alerts had grown to epic proportions, more suited to a state of emergency than the ordinary resumption of the dance season. I figured family and friends were messaging their support upon my return to ballet. No hearts greeted me, no smiley faces either. Instead, a horrifying series of condolences filled the screen. The links to each message were the same. Ballet's newest power couple, Brian Lester and Ariana Bonneville, remake the future of American Ballet Company. When I clicked on the title, a dramatic photograph filled the screen. Brian, looking feverish and passionate, had his hands wrapped around a young dancer's waist. She was bent backwards in an understandably ecstatic pose. The shock of seeing another dancer in my place was so disorienting, I forgot to push the elevator button. I stared at the picture, unable to look away. A voice from behind jolted me out of my funk. Totally amazing, huh? Brian, his arm draped around the shoulders of the girl in the photograph, had an annoying grin on his face. 
I swallowed my gloom and congratulated him. Hitting the big time, I see. Yeah, the article was pretty great. Have you, well, I guess you already know Ariana. I bared my teeth, the closest I could get to a smile, and greeted her politely. Taller than me by a good five inches, she looked down her flawless little nose. Of course I know you. I used to watch you dance when I was a little girl. She flipped her long blonde ponytail over her shoulder and softly laughed. Brian wasn't stupid. He probably knew what I was thinking and he sounded sincere. Leah, you know I appreciate all you've done for me. He patted me on the back. I'll make sure Friedrich keeps you on the rehearsal schedule. If you're up to it, of course. I unlocked my jaw. Thanks, Brian, but I'm fine now. Better than ever. And I can't wait to get back into the rehearsal studio. I'm sure your ballet is going to be great. When we got to the fifth floor, Brian rushed into the men's dressing room. I called after him, hey, before you go, I, I wanted to ask you. He held up his index finger, indicating I should wait. Seven long minutes later, I realized he wasn't coming back. I hope you enjoyed this excerpt of Murder in First Position. And if you'd like to read more about Leah and her adventures in the American Ballet Company, uh, you can purchase the book through every online bookseller, of course, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Books A Million, but also IndieBound, bookshop.org. And certainly feel free to order it from your favorite independent bookseller. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Kathy Stoller, and I'm one of the Sirens of Suspense. I am also the author of the Murder on the Rocks mystery, which includes Bar None, Last Call, and Straight Up, the Nick of Time thrillers, and the three volume Laurel and Helen New York mysteries. Today I'm going to be reading from Last Call. It features Jude Delane, the owner of the Corner Lounge on 10th Street and Avenue B. Jude has been cleaning up after last night's New Year's celebration when she discovers the body of a man with a knife through his heart in the dumpster out back. She recognizes the victim immediately. It's Michael Bevins, younger brother of her customer and neighbor, Art Bevins. Devastated, Jude becomes even more horrified when she learns that Michael, is the latest victim of the New Year's serial killer, whose horrible crimes stretch back more than 20 years. Determined to find this monster, Jude risks her life as she gathers evidence that leads her closer and closer to the killer and the staggering truth that he may be someone very close to him. The story begins on New Year's Eve, 1999. Times Square was packed. Many of the nearly half a million revelers had been there since that morning, waiting in the cold for the glittering Waterford crystal ball to drop. Security was tight. It was the dawn of a new millennium, which brought fears of a Y2K disaster, bringing down computers and creating havoc amongst anything electronic. Over 5,000 police officers were on hand to make sure nothing went horribly wrong. Although the crowd was well behaved, waving banners as they cheered and yelled. No one was having a better time than the four young tourists from Denmark who had arrived in the city the day before. Warming their way through the crowd, the two men and two women pushed in as close as they could to have a close up view of the ball drop. One member of the group, Lucas Jansen, decided to step away from his friends to buy a souvenir for his younger sister. I think she would like one of those t-shirts, he told his girlfriend, Issa Mulder, and pointed to a man a few yards away, selling shirts with the Millennium logo on the front. At six feet, four inches, Lucas stood well above the crowd around him and had no trouble plotting the path to the vendor. 
Hurry back, Lucas, Isa told him, giving him a quick hug. The new year will be here in just a few minutes, and I'll want to give you a special kiss. At 10 seconds to midnight, the ball began its descent, and Lucas was still not back. Isa thought he may have gotten turned around in the mass of people and gave her attention over to the cheers and chaos that erupted at the stroke of 12. Sure, he would join them shortly. The crowd dispersed soon after, but Lucas was nowhere to be found. His three friends looked up above the sea of people leaving the area, searching for the tall blonde man in a red ski jacket. Issa's eyes widened with worry. I don't see him. Where did he go? Tears began to spill from her eyes as she fought her way through the remaining crowd, calling his name. Maybe he stopped for a beer, Elias ventured. Not without us, Issa told him. He'd never leave us here wondering where he is. She shook her head. Something has happened to him. I know it. Three days later, Lucas Jansen's body was discovered in Tompkins Square Park on the east side of Manhattan. No one knew how or why he wound up there. The young man had been stabbed through the heart and died instantly. The first victim of the person who would become known as the New Year's killer. Well, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you are interested in the books, you can ask the library to order it or you can find them at um, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, bookshop.org and Google Books. Last Call is the second book in the series and it and Barnan are out now. So I hope you will take a look. If you have any questions or would like to chat with me, please email me at Kathy, C-A-T-H-I, at kathystoller.com. Thanks. Have a great day. Hi, my name is DM Barr. Tonight, I'll be reading from my newest release. It's called Saving Grace, a psychological thriller. Surprise, surprise, it is a psychological thriller. And it will be released by Black Rose Writing on October 15th, available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. I'm going to be reading from the second chapter in the book. Uh, the first chapter is a murder, so you're going to have to pick it up to figure out who's murder. But I'll start with chapter two. Grace Randell tried in vain to focus on her therapist's questions and not the excitement humming through her veins. Newfound clarity threatened, to, th threatened her mission to maintain her usual flat affect if she hoped to get away with this charade. Behind and above her doctor's head, a kamikaze, fly, a kamikaze fly's repeated attempts to escape the room had captured her attention. It would collide with the pain facing out onto the garden only to retreat and then confront the glass. Grace admired the tenacity. It was either the world's most determined insect or one brain damage beyond repair. If, brain, if flies had brains, that is, she wasn't sure. But assuming it had a brain, one impaired somehow, then they were kindred spirits and what better place to meet than her psychiatrist's office. Grace, you were saying? Dr. Lame, Emma Lehman raised her eyebrows, her blonde page boy and plump, cheerful face, making her appear younger than someone in her mid-60s. How do you plan to handle tonight's event? And this is an aside. I splurged on a slim, cool black dress, black sandals, and a pearl choker, just like Holly Golightly. Well, more chunky than slim, but I don't think Truman Capote will come back from the grave and say anything. Grace tucked away her sarcasm and assumed her usual monotonous tone. I'm not sure, so many new people. Layman would flip as she knew the truth. Over the past month, Grace had committed the ultimate offense, weaning herself off clonopin, Topamax, Abilify, and her other psychotropic meds. While her usual cocktail of pills didn't prevent her from working, driving, or mothering her kids, they dulled her outlook and caused her to doubt her perceptions. Was it so terrible to crave acuity on such a special night? She'd been 100% clean for a week now, though she'd spent part of that time in bed, attributing the nausea, tremors, sweating, and other withdrawal symptoms to a bad case of the flu. 
Her family had bought the story, thank God. So far, so good. Let's look past the strangers. Keep our eyes on the prize. What are your goals for the evening? Despite Layman's urging, Grace hesitated to respond. Far safer to concentrate on the insect's dilemma than her own desire to appear more lucid than languid for just one evening. After 25 years of marriage, didn't Elliot deserve that? If she were present and attentive tonight, it might put an end to their sexual drought. And if so, perhaps the late nights and frequent absences would also end, the ones he always explained away as work-related. Invitations to the company's annual holiday party usually excluded spouses, or so Elliot told her year after year. But this Thanksgiving, he'd made a point of inviting her. It had to mean something. A detente in their Cold War? She'd taken a long, hard look in the mirror that morning. At 45, she no longer got mistaken for Sandra Bullock. But despite the trappings of middle age, the dark under eye circles, the few rogue silver strands that eluded her bottle of Clairol, the unwelcome bulges that homesteaded on formerly flat land, was it possible that desirability didn't have an expiration date? Grace, your goals. The therapist tapped her notebook against her thigh. The flies buzzing reverberated, drowning out layman's question. How to help it escape without appearing too focused? An idea sprang to mind, something that would play right into her doctor's expectations. Grace gasped for breath, slowly at first, and then set steadily increasing until she reached full-blown hyperventilation. She tottered toward the window, winking at the fly, while waiting for laymen to get the, take the hint and let in some cold November air. The doctor jumped up and hurried to her side, leaving Grace delighted at the success of her plan. Swat! Layman pulled her notebook from the window and the fly's tiny carcass fell to the floor. Then she unlashed the sashes and lifted the bottom pane, urging Grace to suck in the lungfuls of oxygen she craved. After a few deep breaths, Grace slunk back to her seat, her burgeoning mania tempered by what she saw as a clear omen of the night ahead. For the next 30 minutes, she sat comatose as Layman rambled on, certain that the doctor expected nothing more of her and angry at herself that for once she had. And that's everything. You'll have to buy the book to hear the rest or read the rest. Thank you.